Loomis versus Bridgman versus Bodum. Abstractions of the head. I'm your instructor, Andrew Joseph Keith, for this portrait sculpting course. In this lesson, we'll be comparing three methods for establishing the basic size, the shape, and the angle or tilt of the head using what are called block-ins. You might be wondering, what is the purpose of this type of abstraction? Good question. Excellent question. When sculpting, it's important to move from the most simple and basic and then add complexity as we add more of the features. First off, let's define what a block-in is and why it's important for portrait sculpture. The block-in, or the roughed-out abstraction, is a base for building out the rest of the features of the portrait. It's a place where we can draw guidelines, make measurements and comparisons, and start to add the features like the profile of the face. It's meant to be a form and space that we can build our features on top of. Block-ins can be done ahead of time to prepare for a modeling session to save on that expensive modeling time. For it to be a good block-in, it needs to have a few fundamental characteristics. It needs to provide the structure for the sculpture. It should be roughly the right shape of your average head from the front and side and top views. It needs to give us a surface to draw guidelines and it should be slightly smaller than the finished sculpture will be so that we have room to build on top of it without worrying about the head becoming too large. In order to simplify something that's very complex down to its most essential characteristics, it takes a lot of understanding and knowledge about that thing. If I asked a beginner student to make a simplified version of the head, they probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about and each student's version would be very different, I'm sure. Hopefully after this video, you'll know a little bit more about the head and you'll be able to try all of these methods to begin a portrait sculpture. Once you've tried them all, you can see which one you like best. The first method that you're probably already familiar with is the Loomis head. This is our old friend and a great abstraction to help us map out a simple version of the head. In the figure sculpting course, I showed you how to sculpt a Loomis head, which has clear plane changes and a relatively smooth surface. For a more in-depth look at the Loomis head, be sure that you watch that lesson. Now for a roughed out abstraction, it's not important for all of those planes to be perfectly smooth, but it should have similar proportions to the average Loomis head, or perhaps a little bit thinner, because that will make it easier to add the widths with clay. The second method is the Bridgman head, or blocky method. It resembles George Bridgman's simplified head drawings. This is the version I often like to use when sculpting the full figure. It's similar to the Loomis head, but more blocky with clear plane changes. This one helps me see the symmetry and angle of the head a little bit easier than the Loomis method. For both of these methods, we will also sculpt a cylinder for the neck to give us a sense of how the head attaches to the neck and shoulders. The third and last block in method that we'll consider is called the Bodum method, introduced by Robert Bodum and his approach to the portrait. This method focuses on the high points of the skull as opposed to the planes like the other two methods. Here you can see where I outline the high points on this skull. These are the areas that we need to build out with lines of clay that travel vertically and horizontally. Because I like the Bodum method most for capturing accurate portraits, let's go in depth on how to sculpt the Bodum method block in. To build this head, we'll start by making a cylinder for the neck that leans forward. Then, building off of this, we can create a flat pancake of clay that will represent the center line that divides the head from left to right. Imagine a center line that goes from the front of the face over the top of the head to the bump of the occipital bone. If you have a skull, you can observe it from the side view to try to capture the shape of the head. Don't be afraid to be more angular with the edges and make the outline more blocky than it would be in reality. A distinct plane change that shows where the head transitions from the top of the head to the front plane of the face will give you a reference to measure from. This is helpful if you're sculpting from a live model and using a pair of calipers. Make sure that this clay is relatively flat so that the center line isn't twisting through space. Now we can start to think about the high points on the side of the head and start to lay them in. The widest point of the head is towards the back 
above and behind the ear. To build this out, we can add another slice of clay in this area that's perpendicular to the first layer of clay we established and that runs vertically up and down. We'll want to do this on both sides and you can look from above to make sure that the two sides are symmetrical. Once we have some clay, we can then look at the head from the front view and try to establish the outline that follows how the shape of the back of the skull looks with accurate high points. We can now add the widest point on the facial mass of the skull, which follows the rhythm of the cheekbone or the zygomatic arch from the cheek to the ear. We'll repeat the process of building out the thin wall of clay that is perpendicular from the first profile pancake, but instead of running vertically, this one will run horizontally and we'll start a little ways back from the front plane of the face. We can then fill in some of these inside areas, but don't build out the inside up to where it touches the high points. We want to keep those high points in place. We can also address the jawline and give an indication of it at this stage, but don't worry about building it out too much. We can do that later when we're observing the model or our references. These are the high points that we want to have established. Once they're present, take time to adjust and correct any asymmetry between these forms. Remember that this is going to be our scaffolding and so we want to have a reliable structure that we can count on. We can draw in some additional guidelines to remind ourselves exactly where the center line and high points should be. I love the other methods for their speed and simplicity, but for capturing a likeness or sculpting from a live model, I think that I actually prefer this method for its structure. I feel that it's more conducive to building out the forms with little pieces of clay as opposed to carving away some areas like we might have to do with the bottom head or the Loomis head. Your assignment is to sculpt all three of these methods and then decide how you'd like to do your own block-ins. You can use any of these methods or a combination of the three. You know the drill. Grab some clay and do the assignment yourself. All right, stay productive, stay creative. See you around.